uh, hello, uh, good, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, also, good afternoon if you are in Europe or Africa. I hope you're doing fine and healthy despite the pandemic situation. My name is Pian. I'm behavioral economist in Natch Plus. Uh, if you never heard of Natch Plus, it's actually an organization that provides service in consultation, training, and research on behavioral science related topics. Um, I'm really glad to be here. This is Natch Plus Talk uh, episode six, a forum where experts talk or discuss uh, interesting topics around behavioral economics or uh, behavioral science. A uh, couple of weeks ago, we held a virtual seminar about NACH for COVID-19 health protocol in East Java. Uh, there was Pa Emil Dardak, the East Java vice governor. He gave some speech. Uh, if you miss the event, you could check our YouTube channel and find the recording. There are also many uh, videos uh, and webinar uh, that you might also check. And what about our topics today? Uh, as you might have found in our poster, it says nudging for good. So today we are going to listen and discuss the application of behavioral insights to enhance social and development projects. Uh, for you who work in public domain, uh, donor or development agency, you might expect to gain uh, a lot of knowledge that can be applied in your projects. And today's talk will be amazing because we have some speaker, uh, we have awesome speaker. Uh, she is Miss Alison Zelkowitz, the Behavioral Insight Director of the of Save the Children International. And I will tell you a little bit about how cool she is. Uh, she has a ton of experience in development projects. She has been to many countries to literally save children around the world. Uh, she was uh, appointed as a country director in Thailand, Pakistan, Lebanon. Even now she is in Uganda. Uh, Ms. Allison finished her education in UC San Diego School of uh, Global Policy and Strategy with specialization in international development and NGO management. And for your information, she's the one who found the Center for Utilizing Behavioral Insights for Children, or CUBIC. It's a new initiative launched by Save the Children in Asia. Uh, CUBIC helps save the children and apply learning and evidence from a behavioral science to increase the effectiveness of development programs and enhance impact for children. And the organization is actually the first notch unit in the world to focus specially on the most marginalized children's strike and welfare. So welcome, uh, let's welcome our speaker, uh, Ms. Uh, listen, uh, the time uh, and place is yours. Great. Um, so, good evening. Salamat malam. So, one thing that Pian didn't mention about me is that I actually started my career in Indonesia um, many years ago. Uh, I first studied Indonesian at University Gajamada. And then I spent four years in Aceh. So Indonesia is very, very close to my heart. Um, and it's been fun getting to work with uh, my colleagues in Indonesia again through some of our new projects. So it's, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, so yes, I'm Alison Zelkowitz. I'm the director of CUBIC, the Center for Utilizing Behavioral Insights for Children. And my colleague here, you see her picture too on the screen, uh, Josefina or Joe. She'll also be doing um, one of the last sections of this presentation and talking to you about our project in Indonesia. So um, it's, yeah, it's great to speak to you all. I hope my internet connection remains stable. If not, I'll get back on as uh, quickly as I can. Um, so I first just wanted to tell you a little bit about Save the Children. Uh, so Save the Children is the world's leading independent organization for children. We're over 100 years old now. And we work in nearly 120 countries around the world um, with somewhere around 20,000 staff. And our focus is always on children. We want children to help children survive, learn, and be protected. These are our, what we call our three breakthroughs. 
Um, and as you can see, um, in human behavior is probably the most critical factor in all social development programs and in international aid programs as well. Um, because at heart, at all times, people are making a decision about what they're going to do next, or they're behaving in a way that makes a difference to our programs. Um, so it's really important in everything that we do. But there's a bit of a problem in many social development programs. Um, and a question here, can anybody tell me what CAP stands for? Do you know what K-A-P, the acronym CAP stands for? If you do, you can just type it into the chat. I'd like to see if anyone knows what CAP stands for. K-A-P, you may have heard this before. Anyone, what does CAP stand for? Ah, yes, IU got it right. Well done, IU. It stands for knowledge, attitudes, and practice. That's right. So this is a quite common um, behavior change theory in our work, knowledge, attitudes, and practice. And basically it's that if we provide community members good information, then they will change their attitudes and then their behavior or their practices will also follow suit. So sometimes this does happen, um, but very often it does not. Um, actually good information very, very rarely leads to behavior change. And this is something that most people aren't, aren't aware of, but lots of uh, research from the behavioral sciences has shown that information is usually not enough to create behavior change. And sometimes we can actually um, move in the opposite direction. That's another thing that behavioral sciences teach us. Sometimes if we change behavior first, attitudes might follow afterwards. And I just wanted to give you a small example of this. Um, so I have a quick activity for you all. First, everyone, if you don't have your cameras turned on, please turn on your camera for a second. Most of you have your cameras, but I see some of you don't. Just for one minute, I'm gonna ask you to turn on your camera, then you can turn it back off. But try to turn on your camera if you have one. Great, I see a few of you turning it on. That's great. Don't worry, I'll let you hide after this. Okay, so we've got some of your cameras and even if your camera is not turned on, I want you to try doing the next thing. Now I want you, everyone to smile at your camera for just sm five seconds. Make yourself smile and I'll count. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, you're great. You're all done smiling now. You can turn your cameras back off. And my question is to you, how do you feel? How do you feel? Do you feel, you can type it into the chat if you like. How do you feel after you just made yourself smile for five minutes? The cat's funny, yes. Do you feel any differently than you, than you did before? I'm guessing that if you are basically a normal human being, even though I just made you smile, your attitude is actually a little bit more positive. You feel slightly happier than you did about two minutes ago because basically your behavior changed. You made yourself smile and now your attitude has, um, has followed suit. So this is actually just one very simple example of how behavior can change first and then attitudes follow. But it's really important because this is one of the things that we learn from behavioral science. Um, so the other things that we learn from behavioral science is that people are really complex and life is complicated. And there are so many different influences on the way people behave. You know, it might be the time of day. It might be something that somebody just said to them. It might be the weather. It could be a different ways we frame phrases or questions. But there are so many different influences and it's really important to understand this, how complex people are and how complex our decision-making is. If we really want to design social and development programs that actually address how human beings actually think and make decisions and behave. And fortunately, there's an approach um, that takes this into consideration and it, you can call it applied behavioral science or behavioral insights. And it's basically using evidence from three primary fields from behavioral economics, from psychology and from neuroscience. And it helps us learn about the conscious and non-conscious drivers of human behavior. Uh, and these are called behavioral insights. And some of these behavioral insights you see here on the cube at right. 
Um, now back to a little bit more about CUBIC. So CUBIC stands for the Center for Utilizing Behavioral Insights for Children. This is our team. We're currently based on, um, I think, four continents right now. We're based in North America, Africa, Europe, and Asia. And we have a combination of those um, experienced in behavioral science, in research and experimentation, as well as in de design and development. And as Piana was talking earlier, we're the first behavioral science team in the world to focus on the most marginalized children's rights and welfare, because this is at the core of what, of what everything Save the Children does. And our mission is to apply behavioral science to create positive change for children. By the way, I, you may look at this picture. This picture was actually taken in Aceh about a decade, a decade ago. So I'll try to, try to highlight when we've got the pictures from Indonesia here. Um, so partnership is a real, um, a, a real focus of Cubic strategy, especially in our first year of operation. We've only been operating for one year now, and we wanted to make sure that we can really have the great um, academic and scientific rigor. So these are some of the partners we're currently working with. They're both independent behavioral science organizations, as well as a number of academic partners too. And here is the breadth of our projects in Asia. We've also just started recently working with some projects in Africa, specifically in Kenya and Malawi. And um, I'm just gonna run you through some of our projects now. And then we'll have, um, I think, quite a bit of time for questions and answers after this. But I'm gonna go through some of the projects that are ongoing, some that have just started, and some that have been completed. So we've actually got eight project snapshots. And of course, if you have any questions about these, why don't you go ahead and um, you can start writing them into the chat. And then when we uh, finish up, there'll be plenty of times for Q&A. So the Philippines, we wanted to focus on increasing positive parental engagement. Uh, and this was particularly important in the situation of COVID because so many parents are home, they're stressed, their kids aren't in school. So how can we increase positive parental engagement and also improve children's literacy? And um, if any of you are parents on this call, I'm sure some of you have at some point downloaded a parenting app, or maybe you bought a parenting book and you've just found that actually you never read it, you never used it. Um, it was very difficult to get yourself to be motivated to, to learn these things. So we wanted to really focus on making it easy. And I think this is one of the biggest takeaways for all social and development projects. Um, it's really important to make things as easy as possible for the people we want to reach because they're so busy. Um, I think it is Richard Thaler, he's a very famous um, behavioral economist who said, um, if you make something easy, people do more of it. If you make something harder, people do less of it. So we really wanted to make it easy for parents to improve their engagement. And we discovered a method um, created by uh, a woman named Susanna Loeb at Brown University, and it's called Tips by Text. And it is a series of behaviorally informed text messages that you send to parents of children three to five years old. And it gives parents really concrete things to do with their children. For example, here's one example of how you can engage with, um, with children and help improve their counting skills, even at this very young age. Um, so we adapted this uh, method for the Philippines. We made sure it was contextually relevant. We took out um, items and references that were only US focused and replaced them with um, references that are related to the Philippines. And um, we of course translated it to Tagalog. So in order to uh, make sure that this has an impact, we're measuring this through a randomized controlled trial. Um, and if you're not familiar with those, it's basically an experimental method that lets you determine that your intervention is actually making an impact by having uh, what we call a control group, a group that doesn't get the intervention as well as a treatment group, one that does. Um, so we launched this randomized control trial in December and it'll, uh, the texts are being sent to parents over 40 weeks. Uh, and there's also one group that is not only getting the text, but they're also getting a 10 minute phone call every two or three weeks. Um, so we'll be measuring this, I think in October uh, with an end line assessment that measures children's early literacy, numeracy and social and emotional learning skills. Uh, so in Vietnam, our team in Vietnam wanted to focus on covering coughs and sneezes because they said it's not very um, culturally accepted. Many people in Vietnam do this, don't do this, and they were quite worried about how this is um, how the, how people could be spreading uh, COVID-19 if they're not covering their coughs and uh, sneezes. 
So we decided to do an online experiment for this and frame messages in different ways. Um, we also worked with the Busara Center for Behavioral Economics on this. So one of the framings um, was talking about social norm trends. So basically, if you tell people that there is a new social norm, um, people often want to follow that social norm, even if it's not the majority of people yet, if they know that there's a new trend, people are interested in following this. So you can see this, this poster here is saying that more and more people are starting to cover their coughs and sneezes. Um, then we had one that we were calling the multiplier effect, just really making uh, highlighting that one cough can actually infect many different people. Uh, and we had another one that really was talking about ego or identity of parents and connecting this to um, you are a good parent if you're teaching your children to cover their coughs and sneezes. We also had two other, we had a treatment, uh, we had a control poster, um, which is basically just telling them it's important to co cover their coughs and sneezes, as well as one which is focused on, um, they call it the uh, identifiable victim effect, which is highlighting that somebody gets sick. Now I have the results are still being analyzed. Unfortunately, I don't have the full um, data analysis for you today, but the indications are that the most powerful framing of these was this one at the right, that the one about really connecting with parents' identities of being a good parent, this had some slight significant effects on, on people's likelihood to cover their coughs and sneezes in the future. Uh, so in Bangladesh, we've, we're just starting the formative phase of a project and it's focusing on increasing playful teaching methods with early childhood development teachers or preschool teachers. Um, and this is um, focused on uh, wanting to change what teachers do from rote learning and memorization and moving it to more playful and active methods because uh, young children learn better in this way. And we also wanted to focus on making it easy. So one of the interventions we'll be piloting once preschools are open is simplifying lesson plans so that it's really, really easy for teachers to understand what they need to do and what they need to prepare. But we're also conducting additional formative research now with teachers to really better understand this, the challenges and the barriers that uh, teachers face. However, this project has been a bit slow because preschools have been closed in Bangladesh now for over a year. In Laos, uh, we wanted to focus on improving postpartum care right after women deliver in hospitals and starting early initiation of breastfeeding in hospitals by improving uh, health worker behavior by influencing nurses, nurses and uh, midwives who work with mothers right after they deliver babies. Um, and we created in a number of pilot interventions. One is um, showing public commitments and showing the commitments of the health staff in the facility to show that they're committed to taking care of the mother and the baby, baby and improving the care. The other is having a simplified breastfeeding counseling uh, checklist that nurses would use. And we also wanted to ensure feedback and have more accountability. And by doing this, by getting uh, feedback from the mothers after they're leaving the, the hospital, and then incentivizing that with a, with a chance to win a small prize um, if they fill out the form. And another of our prototypes is, again, trying to improve the relationship between the nurses and the mothers who deliver um, by having a Polaroid interaction. Well, basically, as soon as you know, the mothers are doing all right, it's a few hours after their delivery, the nurse would come in, take a Polaroid photo of the mother and the baby and put it into this little um, card here which they could also use to counsel them about how to initiate breastfeeding. Um, so this was the formative research phase and we're now applying for National Institute of Health funding along with the University of Pennsylvania to actually implement this trial. In India, um, Indi our India colleagues also wanted to focus on a school-based uh, intervention and about increasing hand washing in schools. And so we're, we're installing nudges now, um, which are focused on environmental cues. Um, this is another uh, big takeaway from behavioral science is that our environment, our immediate surroundings are incredibly important. Um, and so we're installing nudges that look like this um, in school hand washing uh, uh, stations. So we've got footprints, we've got handprints also on the water dispensers, some eyes because the eyes help um, kids feel like somebody is watching, a big arrow to the soap dish. Um, so we're installing these nudges now. Um, the challenge is though, 
uh, is that the schools are not yet open in India. So we're planning to do the monitoring when more children are actually back in school. There's a few children in school now, but most are probably going to be back in school in June. So at that point, we have a randomized control trial planned to determine whether these nudges have an effect. Um, one other trial that we did finish, this was we, we wanted to see whether um, changing the way that we phrase uh, what we call a social media call out has any impact on whether or not people click on a social media ad. The Save the Children does a lot of online engagement. So I thought, okay, what happens if we change it from a, a statement, like please do something, to a question? So we actually conducted this uh, global Facebook testing, it's called A-B testing. And I think it was 16 countries to determine if there was any impact uh, between phrasing a call out as a statement or as a question. Now, what we determined is most countries, there was not a big difference. We may have been able to see more of a difference if we had invested more money in the ad budget. Unfortunately, we had a limited ad budget and could only pay for so many different ads. Um, but we did find that there was certainly a significant uh, impact in Nepal and Bangladesh, as well as I think it was Pakistan. So you'll see that some of these did have a preference for questions over statements. And finally, the last program I wanted to talk to you about before handing over to my, uh, my colleague, Joe, is our vaccination acceptance and uptake program, which we are just working on right now. Uh, we're working on with two partners, the Basara Center for Behavioral Economics, as well as uh, Common Thread, which is another behavioral science and uh, community engagement organization. And we're looking to apply behavioral science to ensure high demand for vaccinations. So we'll be putting out a, um, a very simple uh, toolkit of suggestions of what we learned from behavioral science uh, for increasing vaccination uptake. We should be sharing that in the next week or two. In addition, we're starting to work with countries um, as pilot countries to go work with them and do some really thorough formative behavioral research with them to understand the exact uh, behavioral barriers in their country and design solutions based on those barriers. So this is just a new project that, that we've just started right now. Um, now over to Joe to talk you through our Indonesia focus project and then we'll have lots of time for questions right after that. And if um, Piano D Dimas could help Joe unmute in case she's still on mute. Oh, no, I'm unmuted. Great. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Josefina. I go by Joe. Thank you, Allison. Um, okay, so now I'm going to tell you about our Indonesia project where we wanted to focus on encouraging COVID-19 protective behaviors like mask wearing, social distancing, meeting people outdoors rather than inside. Um, so we know people uh, want to follow COVID precautions, but sometimes they fail to do so. So this is where the behavioral science concept of intention action gap shows up, which is when you have every intention of doing something, but because of several reasons you failed to do so. So in the case of COVID, it could be because of behavioral fatigue, perhaps being under this health crisis for so long. Um, therefore, to close this gap, we um, are applying a behavioral insight called planning prompts, uh, which is basically to provide people with a tool that will help them create a simple plan to follow through their good intentions. Um, and there's a lot of behavioral science re research that shows that the creation of simple plans can help people follow through their good intentions. So based on this insight, we developed a WhatsApp chatbot with some of our partners, uh, the Bazaar Center and Ideas42, and also the Bangladesh Tech team. Um, and this WhatsApp bot will help people assess their individual risks and then create a simple plan for which behaviors they will adopt to better protect themselves and their families. So in these slides, you, you can see a screenshot of the chatbot, but um, I'll show you more in following slide. So basically, um, we uh, developed a pilot to test our bot, uh, whose objectives are basically understand how people engage with the bot, how often they do it, uh, if they keep engaging with the board over time and estimate um, other potential impacts 
that I'll explain later. Uh, so these two characters here are the chatbot persona. Um, and I'll show you how they appear in a few more slides. Um, but first I'll show you the chatbot. I will explain to you how the pilot um, was designed. So we wanted to measure the bot effects as rigorously as possible. So we developed a randomized control trial, uh, which basically is that from a pool of 2,100 participants, we randomly chose a treatment group and a control group, uh, where the treatment group will get the WhatsApp link and the control group would not get it. Um, we started the trial a few weeks ago. So far, around 2,000 people have received uh, the link, and the remain uh, the remain ones are the control group. Um, and we will measure our the behavioral effects of the pilot through uh, surveys. So we pre-surveyed um, all the sample, and after the trial ends, we will survey them again. Um, so now I'm going to show you the uh, bot features uh, in order, chronological order of what happens when you start engaging with the bot. So first you receive a link, uh, either as SMS or WhatsApp, and, and the person has to say something to the bot, like let's say hello. So the bot will ask the user um, how the bot should call her and uh, in which language uh, she wants to um, interact with the bot, which could be Bahasa or English. And then the bot will ask eight questions regarding activities the user commonly does. And that's what we call the risk assessments. So in this case, there's one question. Um, do you go to markets or stores to buy goods? And the user here answered yes. And then after the user has responded to the eight questions, the bot uh, starts asking questions for building a protection plan. Um, so since the idea is that the plan is as simple as possible, the bot will tell the user to use only three risky activities to tackle. So this first screenshot, the user uh, told the bot to she, that she engaged in four risky activities. So the bot is asking which three of them the user does more frequently. Um, then once that happened, um, the bot starts uh, list five strategies for chosen risky activity for the user to commit to. So in this case of the uh, shopping activity, the user is saying that she will commit only to shop quickly and not hang around after. And finally, we got our plan. So the, the, um, the bot sends you a photo that you can download on your phone, use it as wallpaper if you want to, um, and that's your um, protection plan. Um, then there also has other cool features, like for example, it has weekly quizzes. So every Sunday, it sends six questions to the user uh, to assess their knowledge and give more COVID-related information. So in this case, it's asking like, how far should you stand from someone to allow a risk infection? Um, and another feature is weekly reminders. Uh, so we know people sometimes will start an activity and not finish it. So that's why we developed this tool. Um, for example, in this one, I was using the bot and I did my risky assessment, but I forgot to implement, um, sorry, to create my protection plan. So three days after I engaged with the bot and didn't finish my plan, I um, received this reminder. Um, and finally, the bot gives COVID-19 related information. Um, so to finish, I, um, uh, next slide, Alison, please. Um, what do we expect with the bot in concrete? So we first hypothesize that individual will engage with the bot, obviously. Um, we also think that after engaging with the bot, individuals will in ha increase their risk perception and improve their attitudes towards healthy behaviors. Um, and also an increase in knowledge uh, and self-reported adherence to healthy behaviors. 
Great, thanks, thanks a lot, Joe. Uh, and one other thing I just wanted to mention about the bot is, is we were showing you lots of uh, screenshots in English, uh, but it ha it's dual languages. So at the start that people can choose if they want to do it in English or in Bahasa Indonesia. We just showed you the English slides because Joe speaks English, <laughs> but we do have it all in Bahasa. And we would, we would love to share it with you as well, but we're pilot testing it now. So as soon as the, um, the pilot of the bot is done, we can share the phone number with um, Luri and Pian and Dimas, and they can share it with all of you. So if you want to start using it as well after the pilot is done, you're very, very welcome to. Um, so just to wrap up and then we'll, we'll follow up with questions. Um, three reasons uh, that I often tell people about to why it's worth applying behavioral insights in social and development projects is that first of all, that they're based on robust evidence. This evidence from behavioral economics, from psychology, from neuroscience. Um, it's not just being made up because of something that we think might work. It's based on real um, rigorous academic evidence. Um, secondly, one of the most important parts of the behavioral insights approach is making sure that we test things and test things through uh, rigorous means as much as possible through randomized controlled trials or quasi experimental trials to make sure that what we do actually is working and actually is changing behavior. So that's another reason that, that I'm an advocate for this approach. And finally, um, the interventions themselves are usually low cost. Generally, it's not about sending people or volunteers or community mobilizers into communities to talk to people and try to convince them. It often ends up being interventions like the ones that we've shown you today, which can be done at scale at very low cost. So these are my um, kind of key advo uh, advocacy points for the behavioral insights approach. And now um, just up to open to questions and discussion. Thank you, Alison and Joe, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, and from the presentation, we, we get a lot of knowledge about uh, how behavioral insight can provide a, a powerful tools to enhance uh, development projects. And let me highlight some points. Uh, we learned that human behavior is critical in development projects. And uh, from the traditional perspective, uh, it's normally goes from knowledge attitude to practice but it can also uh, goes in the other direction and we learned that uh, in in many development projects we can uh, apply some intervention uh, a simple intervention that that uh, can influence people behavior uh, and some of them has uh, have been explained by uh, Alison and Joe uh, which are uh, make things easy uh, and framing message and also uh, creating environmental cues. And uh, these interventions has uh, have been proven uh, very well uh, that they actually works in robust situation. And to test whether uh, it can work or not, you can uh, apply uh, experimental tests or uh, Alison said a random a randomized uh, control trial. And if you're not really familiar with the uh, randomized control trial method, you can actually check our YouTube channel uh, because uh, our previous uh, NATPAS talk, we have a talk about randomized control trial and the speaker was uh, uh, Mbak Amalia from Jepal. Uh, and also regarding the uh, hand washing uh, intervention, uh, Nashville's also have similar projects in East Java uh, and it's done a uh, couple months ago. Uh, we conducted a project with uh, East Java government and uh, British embassy. Uh, yeah, so that's a wonderful presentation. And uh, let's uh, go to the Q&A session. Uh, uh, let's check the chat box. Oh, uh, first question uh, was from Pak Hari. Oh, Prof Hari. Uh, let, 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 uh, let me say hi to uh, Prof Hari. Uh, he's actually 
uh, the one who will be the next speaker in Natsbus Talk in the next session, maybe next month. Uh, selamat malam, Pak. <laughs> Apa kabar? Uh, Baik. He asked uh, whether the the smile uh, that we uh, are actually feeling was because of embodiment. And uh, let's just start with three questions first. Uh, another question from uh, Ali Mudin. Uh, he said, following Alison's presentation of, uh, of the project across Southeast Asia, interventions are unique for each country. Uh, how do the team came up with different insights for each country? And okay, next one uh, from Ba Amalia. Um, he asked what is uh, she asked what is the eligibility criteria to become the beneficiaries mm, okay um so so um pakari uh i'm actually not very familiar with the term embodiment so i think maybe you could teach me uh something about this um my background just for, for everyone who knows i my background is in international aid and development work um, I spent 15 years in the field and this is what my master's in. Um, so, but however, my, my passion is, is now for behavioral science over the last few years. So it's quite very possible that Pak Harry um, is much more aware of this term from psychology or behavioral science than I am. Um, on the question on following Allison's presentation, uh, interventions, how did the team come up with different insights for each country? Um, well, the process that we use and that we promote is a combination of the behavioral insights team's test process and test stands for target explore solution trial um, scale now the explore phase is when we recommend that you do um, qualitative behavioral research to really understand the behavioral challenge that you're facing and the different barriers um, however, in all of our early pilot projects, we all weren't always able to do that. Sometimes we could, for example, with the um, Vietnam project, we were able to conduct some focus groups to understand um, how parents think in Vietnam. Um, but really the insights uh, depend on what we think is the greatest challenge and what our hypothesis is about the, um, some of the, you know, people, some of the reasons that people are not um, not behaving or doing the behavior that we would like them to do. Um, for example, I think the, the make it easy part with the Philippines is just simply realizing that so many parents are incredibly stressed and busy and do not have a lot of time to invest in learning um, to become better parents, that if we really want to overcome this barrier of this like uh, maxed out cognitive bandwidth, we need to make things as easy as possible. Um, so it really, it really depends and it, 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 it most depends on how we analyze and what is the behavioral challenge that we're facing in each context. Um, on the other question, eligib eligibility criteria to become beneficiaries. I think you're talking about the Indonesia WhatsApp uh, chatbot uh, project. We focused on, um, first of all, it's, it, the target group for this pilot is West Java. Um, we took basically Save the Children had a huge database of um, people we had been in contact with before. And so we did an initial pre-survey before the pre-survey to make sure that people, first of all, had a WhatsApp account. And second and all, the one, the, the, the kind of, second of all, that they were adults. And third, that they, um, that we did not want to have too many health workers in there. We were a bit worried because we do a lot of health projects that if we have lots of health workers in there, this is not going to have an impact. So those were the type of person that we actually weeded out. But otherwise, it was people with WhatsApp accounts who were adults in West Java. And maybe Amelia was trying to, to respond. Kian, Amelia, did you have? Uh, yes, it's, yes, it's actually the project of Indonesia. OK, OK. Uh, yeah, the and, first. and your answer actually also uh, uh, answer Andrea's question uh, about how to come up with idea. But uh, uh, following up your your answer, have you ever experienced planning out of a solution idea? Oh. <laughs> the experience of running out of ideas. Um, 
No, I would say not yet. Um, what what I, I am worried about this in the future, I, in in that we are planning to take on some very challenging behaviors. Um, for example, we, we have some projects where we may be looking at um, removing children from very hazardous work um, and hazardous tasks. And so it is a little bit intimidating to think of dealing with some of these very challenging projects. Um, but so far with our current projects, we haven't uh, not had any ideas. Oh, that's good. <laughs> okay, let's move to another question. Uh, we have Mas Dimas here uh, on chatboard. How will you make sure the engagement of the user with the bot appeared during the experiment and after the trial ended? And uh, another question uh, from uh, Ali Mudin uh, about the RCT. Uh, the bot is found to be effective and how this translate to real life cases? Uh, how do you apply in, in real life situation or in another problem, uh, in other uh, issues? Uh, because uh, there are many intermediating variables uh, such as self-efficacy, peer pressure, and etc. cetera. Uh, maybe Joe can answer these two questions. Um, yeah, so regarding the first question, um, so we have, we have information on when and how much users interact with the bot. So the Tech team has a really cool dashboard where you can see like how people are interacting, how often, and they follow, they don't know who is who, right? But um, they know the numbers, so they see for each number, they know when was the last interaction, how often it was the, it was interacting, if, yeah, like how many people completed the risk assessment and protection plan, et cetera. And for the second question, I don't think I understood it um, correctly. Yeah. I, I think, um, I mean, answer that question. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, the secret to any um, randomized control trial is, of course, to make sure that we um, make the groups as equal as possible so that the characteristics are relatively the same um, and that we um, have large enough numbers that things like an individual self-efficacy or peer pressure um, would be common among both groups. So it really has to, like being able to tell the efficacy of the bot is, is based on uh, being able to divide those groups very well and randomly. Okay. Uh, Mr. Ali Mudin, uh, does that uh, answer your question? Okay, well, we are waiting for uh, Mr. Amitan. We can uh, move to another question that are related to methodology. Uh, I think we have three questions uh, about uh, the methodology of RCT or the experimental uh, uh, experimental research that uh, that were has been done for checking whether the intervention uh, works or not. And uh, one of the question was about the measurement, it's from IU. Uh, how do you measure the whether the intervention work or not? And how, do you, how did you decide on those measurements? And from uh, Lisa Listiana, uh, it's about the, uh, the example of variables or me measurement and the number that are normally used in research on behavior. Uh, Alison, you say that you have large number and how large the number is uh, for conducting the RCT. And Nisma also uh, asked about number again. Uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the, the control group in the uh, one of the intervention uh, is far fewer than the treatment group. And uh, how do you uh, justify this or how do you explain why uh, there is 
imbalance between the treatment and the control group. Yeah, let me, I'll take a couple of them and then hand over to Joe because I think there's a couple she might be able to respond to better. One thing that I think that slide was not 100% accurate in that, well, it, what you explained was accurate, but the, um, the bot has been sent to about 2,000 people, but we've only surveyed, pre-surveyed 600. So the treatment group is around 400 of, the pre, of those surveyed, and the control group is about 200. So actually the groups are not as um, imbalanced as one would think. Um, we do have a concern though, it may not be, those groups may not be large enough, 200 and 400, um, depending on whether or not people actually decide to engage with the bot or give up. It may be too small of a sample size, but it was the best that we could do under the uh, time constraints that we had of getting this, this group. Um, so it's actually not that large of a difference. Um, and the other said, why did we send it out to 2000? Because we also wanted to measure their interaction with the bot on this dashboard that Joe's been talking about. So there's a tech dashboard where we can see, okay, when do people start using it? Um, how far do they get? It? Do they engage with it once or twice? So that's why we sent out to more than only the pre-surveyed group 600. That's why it went out to an additional 1400 people. Um, the other bit, how do you measure whether the intervention worked or not? Um, Joe, do you want to take a stab at those ones first, as well as the example of the variables or measurement? Yeah, sure. So I think first of all, um, maybe this was not clear, but people do not know that they are part of a trial. They know that they've been surveyed, obviously, because we called them. Um, but they don't know that they are being part of a trial. Um, that's the first thing. And for measuring, we developed the surveys in a way where we could capture what we wanted to know. So for example, to capture um, attitudes towards preventative behaviors, um, we included a question that was something like, um, like, Consider these situations. Um, yet, yeah. sorry, can you hear me? Yep. Ah, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, so it was like, consider this situation. Um, people should, uh, should often go to places of worship. Uh, do you agree? Do you not agree? Um, do you agree partially? <laughs> Stuff like that. Or, uh, um, then for knowledge, like knowledge is quite obvious, right? Like, um, like for using a face mask, do you need to A, cover your mouth, B, cover your nose, C, cover your mouth and nose? Um, so there were several questions like that. And depending on how we were framing the question, we will be capturing knowledge, attitude, or risk perception. And for doing that, we, go, we went over some behavioral research and we also worked very closely with our colleagues of the Busar Center and Ideas42 who are experts in this thing. So they, they have a lot of training on um, how to do this kind of surveys. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, and the only thing to add to this is we did try to, we tried er, early when we were designing this um, trial to see if we could think of a way that we could measure actual behavior, um, but we just couldn't figure out a way to do it with the chat bot. We couldn't think that we could um, observe hundreds or thousands of people. And especially when the chat bot is focusing on lots of different situations, it gives people, I think, eight different risky situations and ask them which they will, you know, which ones they want to plan for. So we couldn't figure out a way to actually observe their behavior and see if individuals were following their plans because uh, each of their plans is very, very specific to them. Um, so unfortunately, we had to rely on self-reported behavior as well as the attitudes uh, and knowledge in this uh, in the chatbot. We can't actually determine whether they're telling the truth or not. Ian, can, can I follow up? to mm. that question, specific questions about mm. self-report. I want to know uh, mm. your opinion, Alison and Joe. Like, um, if I'm not mistaken, if you have a look at the literature in um, um, during the coffee, 
most paper, most research, they, um, they just measure like using self-report mechanisms. So I want to, I want to know your opinion about how, how this self-report mechanism would really, really, you know, uh, depict the real behavior in the society. Mm. I guess, I mean, the theory with this, yes, everybody, when they self-report, they report better, um, more positive behaviors than they're actually doing. But considering that it's a trial, we should see that kind of inflated self-reports, both among the control group as well as the treatment group. So hopefully balance out between those groups. And so the, the positive bias would be reflected equally amongst them. But yeah, fully agree. Like self-reported behavior is not an ideal measurement at all. We just couldn't come up with anything better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and I think I, can I can I add one one more? Yeah, sure, yeah. sure. So, uh, I I also want, because like most of your project that you sent um, just now, like measuring real behavior, and mm. for us it's quite difficult to do that. In particular, mm -hmm. if you want to measure real behavior in in a pandemic uh, issue, like you want to to measure the hand watching behavior, etc. So how how are you going to do that? Yeah, well, the hand washing we're just we are going to have um, enumerators or monitors at the schools um, and try to put them in a place where they are um, allowed to be sitting or standing, but not too um, close. So they can still observe the behavior, but they're not hopefully infringing or influencing the behavior. Um, and then with the Philippines trial, that one, we're, because we're using, a, um, we're using an objective learning assessment at the end line, it's called the IDELA tool, um, International Development Early Learning Assessment, I think is what it's called. And it's been used by Save the Children and other partners for over a decade now. So because we'll be using that, we'll be able to see if there were impacts of the, um, the messages on the children's learning. Though we also do have um, some self-reported behavior in that one as well. For example, we asked about a number of parenting behaviors at the beginning of the trial, before the trial. And we'll be asking about some of the same parenting behaviors at the end because we can't actually watch parents every day in their homes. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, thank you for, for the follow up question. And I can actually relate uh, to the uh, notion of how, how hard it is to measure real behavior. Uh, even what we did in East Java, we, we uh, so we set up a, 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 a camera to really mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. measure whether uh, people uh, get their hand wash or not before coming to uh, office and yeah it's it's resourceful to do that yes uh, we did consider cameras as well but we thought it would just be um it would be even harder than employing people to do it um especially in india the the salary the the cost is pretty low in india so it would be a lot easier and simpler and fewer tech challenges if we just had people watching from a distance but uh, yeah doing a video is is a great way to do it if you have the technical capacity Okay, uh, we have lots of questions here, and <laughs> I'm not sure we can cover all uh, everything. But, uh, but let's try. Uh, we have question from Irfan Gani uh, Alim, uh, and Pak Irfan would like to uh, uh, unmute uh, to hello, please. Yeah, actually, the context has been explained by Mr. Lu Ruri. Thank you. Uh, yes, and I just I see the question here about the cap model. I'm sorry if I wasn't clear on that. What I'm saying is the cap model is um, is is rather old fashioned, <laughs> and it's one very traditional model. But behavioral science actually often turns that on its head and says you can often change behavior first, and you can change behavior more easily, and then attitudes will follow suit. Um, so I, I hope it didn't come across as saying cap is the is the way to do it. <laughs> Okay, we also have question from uh, Rafari. Uh, why you choose bot as the tool of intervention? 
maybe you could explain a little about the features that will induce the behavior and what happens if the bot cannot communicate as humans normally do. Um, why did we choose the bot? Uh, so uh, basically, um, we wanted to design something that could be scalable. Um, and we, yeah, scalable, low cost, because so many interventions are not scalable or low cost. So we thought, okay, what can we do that can reach lots of people with, with very little money? And we looked at developing an app, um, but we thought the applications are too often not used or abandoned. Um, and we also looked at regular text messages, but we decided to go with the WhatsApp chatbot because WhatsApp is so popular in Indonesia. People already have it. Most people already have it on their phones, enjoy using it every day. And so we wanted to use a method that, um, that people can, it, it's already common to them. That's why. Yeah, yeah, WhatsApp is very uh, common in Indonesia, and uh, I would like to let you know that there is there is also another in initiative from uh, Lapor COVID nineteen. If you know, so it's a uh, one of the uh, an organization that provides chatbot uh, to to let citizen report. Uh, anything regarding the COVID-19 uh, situation. For example, mm -hmm. like uh, uh, a breaking law about like, for example, there are many people gathering, then you can uh, chat the bot and uh, give the report and uh, the bot will send it to the government to do something. Yeah, something like that. Oh, cool. <laughs> uh, there is, there are other technical questions uh okay yeah this one from hesti arini uh she asked about uh, the duration of the project how long uh, ideally uh, it should be and is there any follow-up study after the the study uh, for example the the bot trial has uh, if it has completed is there any follow-up and another uh, technical question, uh, uh, how do you get the participants of the project? Uh, do you open recruitment uh, or do you collaborate, uh, did you collaborate with a local government or else? Hmm. Um, so on the first question, how long the trial is, um, one of the challenges that we found is most that we we didn't expect as much as that we have faced is that it's hard to get people to click on the bot for the first time <laughs> so we first tried to send it to them via whatsapp but whatsapp is um has a lot of restrictions about getting a message from sending a message from an unknown person to another person so we tried to do this for a while and kept getting blocked. And so, <laughs> and the other thing we found out with WhatsApp is that if, if, if an unknown number sends something to another unknown number, the first thing that WhatsApp does is ask the recipient, is this spam? <laughs> so of course you're we getting blocked, we weren't getting to people. Um, so then we thought, okay, uh, what we'll not next do is we'll try to send it out by a traditional SMS and see how many people. So now we know from a WhatsApp, what percentage of people getting an unknown message from an unknown user, what percentage of them will click on a link. It's pretty low, as you can imagine. So next, what we've done is we've sent out regular text messages with the link so people can get it from their text messages. But we know that um, in Indonesia, a lot of text messages are used for spam. So um, we also think, okay, the uptake from that is not gonna be that much. But what we're also learning from this is, okay, if we send it out to all these people by text message, we'll at least know that in the future, if we send it out by text message, it's five or 10 or 15% of people will actually click on it and start using it. So those are the first two methods. Starting from next week, we're actually going to um, have a very quick call with the people who are in the, um, in the treatment group and say, listen, we're sending you this bot, please try it and, and let us know how it goes more or less um, because we really need them to use it to find out if it works or not. So we're trying um, three different methods um, uh, to getting it to people. So I guess that was the, a very long-winded um, way to say that once we get it into people's hands, 
um, and that they start using it. The plan is that they use it for about five weeks and then we conduct the end line uh, survey. But th that is happening right now, which is why we can't send it to you yet. And we don't have a report because the pilot has just started a few weeks ago. Um, and then I think there the second question was on how people get into the studies. It really depends on the situation. For example, in the Philippines, um, we received um, lists of uh, parents from the Ministry of Education, parents who had enrolled their children in early childhood development programs. So we used those lists uh, to enroll people in the trial. Um, for, as I mentioned previously with the Indonesia one, we were actually using databases that Save the Children already had in Indonesia. Um, and then, of course, in the hand washing study, it'll just be the children who goes to the school. So it really depends on what the trial is. Oh, about, uh, sorry, just, uh, just techni another technical question from me. Uh, how, how did you get the, all these numbers? How did we get the phone numbers? Yeah. Ah. Um, well, the phone numbers, again, for the internal one via Save the Children Indonesia, we already had the phone numbers because um, they had had some sort of engagement with Save the Children previously. Um, so for those who are um, researchers, that does mean that it might be a slightly biased sample, but at least the sample is equally biased and that we had, they had all at some point engaged with Save the Children. Um, and then, uh, yes, we got the phone numbers for the Philippines from the um, Ministry of Education. But it, it is, it's also a good, it's a good question to ask because um, people nowadays, people um, don't always like to be called if they don't know what the reason is. Um, so even though we've gotten all their phone numbers, getting people to talk to us for the first time can be challenging. Um, so so it, is, it is difficult often getting participants in a trial like this, especially if it's like phone based. Okay, that's, I guess, pretty uh, clear. Uh, yeah, what's other questions? Oh, another question from Ayu. Uh, the mom test is particularly good resource which highlights how we, uh, how we reduce social desirability bias in interviews and self-reported. Oh, this is not actually a question. It's just to uh, emphasize more about- uh, Can I have one more question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so just, just thinking about this RCT um, mechanisms and want to know your, your experience doing the RCT. Have you ever find difficulties when doing RCT where the conditions that that uh, you found in the field is actually um, uh, blurring the, the 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 sense of RCT itself? So you can't really control the group, for example, and and. How do you come out with 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 how how can you overcome that kind of situations? Yes, in in the lab doing RC is really really uh, easy, but in in the field, I think it is quite sophisticated. Yeah, mm. yeah I mean, so far because most of our you know projects and trials are underway, I can't say that I have experience having overcome that. I can tell you, I'm worried about that for our Philippines projects. What I'm most worried about is since we all these children are um, uh, right now, most they're not in school. They're children three to five years old who should be in preschool, but they're not because of COVID. My concern is that um, some of the children before the end of the 10 month trial will go back to preschool and some will not. So that will obviously really impact um, their learning by the time we run the end line assessment. But I think the only thing that we can do is we're planning to add in the baseline uh, questionnaire, did your children go back to school during this time? And if so, um, and if so, when? So that we can factor that in when we're doing the data analysis at the end. Um, but my hope is that, that you know, this all schools open at the same time and all kids go back to school 
at the same time, um, but that may not be the case. So we'll have to try to um, adjust for it when we do the final data analysis. Okay. Oh, I just realized that uh, there is Andrea here. She's actually one of the researchers in NATS Plus. Uh, hi, Andrea. <laughs> and he asked question about the uh, the ideas of, of the intervention. Uh, I think we discussed that already. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Were there any any other questions? People can also unmute themselves if they just want to, to ask. A yeah, question. and also if you have question in Indonesia, just uh, you can also type in Indonesian and I can help you uh, uh, translating the question. And actually, Alison can speak Bahasa, right? <laughs> Bisa. <laughs> Bisa yeah, so, so it's okay to, <laughs> to ask question in Bahasa. Uh, <laughs> we'll try. We'll try it. If I need you to translate, I'll let you know. <laughs> I can oh, probably oh, yeah. read, it, uh, read it better. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Ilfan here uh, uh, would like to share some uh, concern. And if you want to add something, you feel free to unmute yourself and give some uh inside hello uh yes uh actually uh it is my personal you, you know my personal concern because uh my mission is to enhance uh mental health in adolescents but coming up to a research saying that human brain is limited to remember information because uh, human brain really forget uh, for meaningful purposes. Therefore, any knowledge that they gain, uh, they may forget in the next day unless they do reflective practice. And it is really uncommon we can see in people from low socioeconomic backgrounds, especially in Indonesia, we suffer from uh, you know, literacy. Therefore, it is my personal concern. Yeah, I think, I mean, I fully agree. And also as a middle-aged person, I certainly see myself forgetting my, most of, uh, most things that I, I, I quickly learn. I guess one thing that I would say from the behavioral science perspective is this is why habit creation is so important. And the more you can study about habit creation, I think um, you can start to learn some, some tricks of how to, I guess, maybe get yourself to study better or um, how to, uh, you know, really make the most desirable behavior something that we do um, without thinking about them. They're like moving something that is a deliberate, thoughtful process to something that's automatic. Um, but I can't. Uh, I don't have any, of course, solutions for how to, um, to how to increase increase people's memories of, of certain material, other than uh, lots of repetition and touch points. But uh, something amazing has been done on the social media, such as Instagram. They have a design model whereby uh, the users are engaged, even addicted to the application. They don't uh, tell to open the apps, and they open app voluntarily and without any interventions. They do that on their own. And it is something miraculous that I try to understand from their point of view. Yeah, yeah. Hi, sorry. Can I just add? Um, so as a background, I'm a psychologist. I was a clinical psychologist trained as a clinical psychologist, and then I turned into a UX researcher. So what you said about Instagram is really interesting because basically it's not just information. It's also social feedback that they're getting, and that in itself is rewarding. But also I wanted to say about information, like how much we retain information also depends on how it's presented. Like if you have a lot of images on Instagram, then it would be a lot more engaging than if it's just text. And there's also, um, if you present information um, as a list, for example, you'll probably um, forget the middle part, but not the beginning and the end. So it's not, there, not all information is um, equally retained. Oh, good point. 
Thank you, I hope. Yeah, thank you. But then again, uh, we can argue about that because uh, in Instagram, we know mindless scrolling. When we do mindless scrolling, although there are pictures, we might forget uh, the information written in the, in the pictures because of the mindless scrolling. We have limited cognitive activity in, uh, during the activity of mindless, mindless scrolling. Uh, thank you for your insight, though. Yeah, thank you, Irfan. Uh, maybe next time we can have another session about uh, the social media and uh, and things that we just discussed. Yeah, and uh, I think we are running out of time. But uh, let's have uh, one other question. This one is a sweet question. Uh, was it the more the uh, most memorable thing uh, when you when you're doing your project? This is from Risa. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll tell you one. In, in a, as uh, I was mentioning about uh, recency, you know, we remember things that they happened. But I can tell you um, one thing that really warms my heart with our uh, Philippines trial is I mentioned um, there's two treatments groups. There's one that is just getting the text messages. And there is one that is getting text messages plus a phone call, about a 10 minute phone call every, um, first it was two weeks, now we changed it to three weeks to find out how the text messages are going and give some support. Because our theory is, as people get the text messages and a phone call, they'll be more likely to actually do the activities with their kids. Um, so the most memorable or rewarding thing I've heard so far is one of the fathers that one of the enumerators called who's receiving the text messages says that he is um, writing them down, writing them all down in a red book so that he can remember to do them later, that he's actually finding them so useful that he's collecting them and taking the time to do it. So I would say that's something that in the midst of a trial was really heartening for us as the people implementing the trial because we thought, okay, even if it doesn't have a big impact on everyone, at least for that one guy who's really learning something, it's really, it really means a lot to us. So I think that also says something for why it's nice to have qualitative data so you can get some kind of these uh, contextual feedback as well. Yeah. How about you, Joe? Do you have any memorable moment when you're doing your project? Um, I think I would say that one of the most memorable things I've heard is, um, I think when, when I just entered the team, we had a call with our Bangladesh team. And one of the Bangladesh team members said that the teachers were like very eager to learn new methods for teaching and that they were really excited to get sort of like a new way of training. And that was very motivational because it was like, okay, this is actually gonna be useful for them. Like they're waiting for this. So even though the trials hasn't started yet, like um, we're very excited to start because we know these teachers would, will value um, all the insights we'll give them. Yeah, uh, actually, I can feel you because uh, last time we run project in East Java, we we conducted a, a small training to, to the uh, officer, and uh, one of the participants uh, was really excited to learn about the method in uh, in behavioral science, and uh, I think it made me uh, excited as well. Uh, and it's like uh, she shared her energy to me, and and yeah, that's that's also memorable for me. Um, so yeah, uh, I think that that last question caused uh, this uh, webinar, and I would like to thank uh, both of you, Alison and Joe, for uh, presenting a very uh, fruitful knowledge uh, on uh, development projects and how behavioral insight uh, can be applied in those projects. Um, any last uh, 
last last things uh, to say uh, for all of us? Uh, the, the only thing that I would like to say is, um, again, thumbs up to Nudge Plus. I think you guys were the first behavioral insights team or applied behavioral science group in Indonesia. So it's really great that you have started and, and been the innovators in this field. And I think um, we need more teams like yours uh, working, in, um, working in Asia and working in non-Western countries. So um, yeah, we're very excited to keep finding out about what you do and potentially collaborating with you in the future. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm also looking forward to have a, a collaboration <laughs> in the future. Uh, and yeah, once again, uh, thank you uh, for your presentation. Uh, and before closing this event, uh, I would like to give some information that uh, Nastos also have a YouTube channel and this uh, webinar will be uploaded in the YouTube. So if you miss uh, some parts of this webinar, you can check our YouTube channel. Uh, and we also have a link in and website that uh, will provide the information or a summary of this uh, webinar. Uh, maybe last thing before we close this Zoom, can we have a picture together? So <laughs> please sure. uh, turn on your camera so we can have a picture together. This time without yeah, cat once again, picture. Not... We don't have cat picture, but uh, <laughs> let us see nice. your smile. <laughs> nice to see your pictures and your faces. <laughs> okay, yeah, please. I'm going to take a picture uh, one two three uh, another page another picture one page oh, yeah. <laughs> okay one two and three yeah Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this webinar. I hope this is uh, useful for you. And see you next time in Natural Stop <laughs> 7. Bye bye. Bye. Thank bye. you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye bye. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.